Several things. Okay. Ooh, cradle to career initiative. That's good. Cancel. I think that's canceled. So we're, we're, we're 20 minutes ahead of time. Discussion with APTRA board. Perfect. Is APTRA board ready to discuss? Yes. Who's your chair? Are you the chair? I am. What would you like to discuss, Ron? Well, what? Hmm? I'm acting chair. Yes? Sir? Would like to say something. I think we're here to, to discuss the uh, the uh, proposed changes to the guidelines dealing with retirement. Okay. That's you know, first thing on our agenda. I think we've been, this has been in the works for at least two, maybe two and a half years. Um, and uh, we've done some additional research on it and everything else. And the board has come back with a recommendation that basically what we do is we allow uh, retirees up to six months. I think you should have uh, the, the the ordinance request and the uh, and the, the guideline changes in your packet. Right. Uh, we did make some some changes to it, uh, but basically it would be allowing retirees to rent for up to six months uh, to a qualified employee through the APTRA through the APTRA rental program. They'd have to qualify through APTRA, and they'd have to um, the, they'd have to get approval of the homeowners association. So that everything, you know, basically all the policies we follow now with our rental program would be in effect for these as well. And the rents would be restricted to what? Uh, I think it would be fifty dollars above uh, what the uh, cost, of, cost of that of that housing is. Well, in other words, it would be it would be mortgage costs, uh, utility costs, if any, condo dues, and fifty dollars. Doesn't that penalize people like me that have paid off our mortgages? No, because we have an adjustment for you and for me. And how does that work? It's in the guidelines. Well, I, I know, but people out there aren't watching it. It's, it's all their costs or what's in the guides, guidelines, which, whichever is greater. Okay. So if they paid off their house, they can use what's in the guidelines. If they have all these costs, but what's in the guideline is greater, they can charge that amount, what's in the guidelines. And so how are the guidelines, how does that work? My house is worth 117,000 or something. It doesn't go by what your it goes by what your category, category is, is and what your size of your unit is. Okay, so as if I were a category, whatever I am. So you would be a category. Rental what did unit. you buy it at, Nick? Three. What was you were no, category was, three when you bought it? What are we threes well, or twos? Just category three that we have. So I might be a three. three. Okay, so you're category three. So whatever the category three uh, guidelines say in terms of. For a uh, rental of six to eight hundred square feet. Right. A two bedroom. Is it a two bedroom, one bedroom? One bedroom. One bedroom. Of course the Look live at the work chart, unit and the cross. Pick out that number and that's it. So it is that it's that simple as a chart just Yeah, it is a, it's all charted out. So it would be whatever that rent is and then my dues or something, I, I pay dues and utilities and that kind of stuff. Right. Okay. That sounds pretty reasonable. No. It is. We're not trying to. We're not trying to get anybody to make money on this thing. It's not a. It's not a profit incentive for retirees, but it does allow them to get away for a certain period of time, up to six months. Okay. And uh, and make that that housing available to to people who are coming into town for the season. Generally speaking, we suspect that it would probably. Uh, be more applicable to the winter season than to the summer season. Well, you say it's six months per year? Yeah. Yes. What if you had six months at the end of the year and six months at the beginning of the next year? Could you do that? Uh, well, they still have to come be, I think that technically they could probably pull that off. <laughs> However, I don't think that's our intent. If they wanted to leave for a year, they could ask for a, leave, a year leave of absence, and we'd grant them that and give them and give them the ability to rent. So they they have they have that ability under the guidelines to stay away for up to two years. Marcia, a um, couple of clarifications in the memorandum that you got. It did say that they can't rent their home out if you know during the three months as it stands now. Actually, anyone can like during the summer if it's a music student. There are some exceptions right, right. for I, shorter than six that. month okay. rentals. But um, the other thing that we did at the request after the joint meeting that we had before was having the pros and cons, because this would keep us from having to build more seasonal housing 
if the you know economy gets much better and we need seasonal housing, the employers in town could actually work with seniors or housing office to say these are seniors who want to rent, this is when they're doing it. It would actually give us some more options that wouldn't tie up, you know, long term rentals that <coughs> can go for year round employees. Okay. Council questions? Or Commission, comments, questions? I have a question. <coughs> Rob, go ahead. So there, there is an application in here with a, a, a formula on the amount that you can charge, which also includes, which wasn't mentioned for the public out there, insurance, property tax, and those sorts of things that could be charged as well on a pro rata basis right. per month. Um, but I didn't see any information in here regarding how a lease could be written to such tenant. Could you do a security deposit um, and those sorts of things uh, and how that would be I judged on? I residential <coughs> leases would, are really easy okay. to, to uh draft. Just because people are going to ask that question yes. when they're trying to rent their place. Can I charge first and last month's rent up front? Can I ask for two months security deposit? You know, if, if you know, how, who judges, you know, the, the damage to the place, that sort of thing. Those questions, I mean, it'd, be, it'd be just be smarter to have that stuff documented somewhere within APSHA to say this is what we recommend for people when they're renting their place. Because people I, are going to ask the question. I, I, I think that's a great suggestion, but I don't think we have to amend the guidelines to do yeah. that. No, no. But we could... APTA could create regulations so that you would know what a standard lease was and what you could charge and not charge and so on. And that's a great idea. We've had yes. some conversations regarding um, the length of this program. We were thinking perhaps a, a three-year trial basis to see how this works. Mm -hmm. um, but frankly, we don't know anybody don't in know. town over 65 that doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we don't know how, how deep the program will, will actually go. True. Okay. Well, most others. Uh, Rachel, Steve Gadron. Yeah, I um, would agree. I think Rob has an excellent idea and, and the idea of a sample lease type of thing. Um, when um, you rent to a, a roommate, uh, you know, which I've done before to prove with APCHA, I just got a standard lease from... Uh, Sandy's office supply and you know checked off the provisions that weren't there but I think it's really helpful for people to think about their own protection in terms of that security deposit and so on um, I guess the two questions I have is one is that we've we've had issues in the past rarely but we've had them where someone rents a place at the allowed rate but then tells the person, well, you know, this is great, but now you have to pay $250 a month for leasing my furniture uh, or something like that. There's been people who've tried to avoid the guidelines and the caps. Then two years later, that person comes back to APCHA and says, I was overcharged, and, and will you pursue a case to try to get some of my money back? And it was just this end note that said APCHA will not review any of the detailed arrangements between the owner and the tenant. And I'm, I would imagine you're referring to, I will water the plants once a week, or, or a ra no cats, no smoking tobacco in my unit, these sort of things. But I think that we need to have something that clarifies, both for the tenant and the renter, that no other additional financial arrangements have been made, or guaranteed, or promised, or committed. And so that's one point. And then the other is I just needed some clarification on the recommendation. Um, is there a minimum amount of time? Could you do it for <coughs> four months and not a six-month lease? Yes. Okay. But is it, you it's can't, up, it's up, up to, to six okay. months. And I, I, you can't have exceed you, six months. Have you thought at all about putting any limit on that, the, the saying it has to be longer than one month, perhaps eliminate just vacation rentals or, you but, know? But why, do you, why would you want to do that? They have I, to prove they're working. I, I, I just, you have to fulfill the they work have to, requirement. Right. It well, has you know, to be cleared first. Well, I was just thinking about, do we put ourselves in a position where a lot of people are you know, out of a place to live December 15th because they, they got it for three months from August to December, and then suddenly, you know. You know, but basically, Rachel, I think what's been happening is a lot of the, uh, the seasonal workers that are coming in, yeah. 
because of what's been happening with the uh, immigration and everything else, have been, and what the ski company is doing in terms of what their employment policies are, a lot of the leases are shorter. Uh, and, and what's happening is that you don't, you're not getting November, first half, December, April's, maybe second half of March rents anymore. So the thing is, is that if you want a minimum, you know, put a minimum of at least one month on that, but uh, up to six months, you know, there are other reasons why we do six months, but sure. but I think that I think <coughs> you're, you're going to find that if someone someone comes in, and we have a lot of rentals for people who come in on construction projects, things like that, who work here, and they're only here for a month to six weeks. So we're not trying to, you know, we, I think we have to broaden hor our horizons when we talk about seasonal workers here. They're not just people coming in to work for the ski company. There are, there are other people coming in for other reasons, and they stay for a shorter period of time than, this, than five months or four months. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those explanations of your thinking. Uh, Marcia um, and Steve. Rachel, I think the idea of having, you know, like kind of a disclaimer that could be attached to the application that says these are the restrictions on this about, you know, they can't charge you for anything additional that would be signed by the tenant and the homeowner that would have to be presented with the application, I think would protect everyone, and I think it's a great idea. Steve, uh, Steve Skadron. Thank you. Marcia, you mentioned goals. This is trying to, to satisfy in the pros and cons uh -huh. earlier. Is one of the goals, it's not listed here in the memo, but is one of the goals to get more employees into units without building, without building more units, would you say? Um, it, it's more to fill a need that we may have without having to build more units to, ser to serve that need. Uh -huh. Because when we talk about, you know, seniors, I mean, right now, you know, the seniors can leave for three months and they don't have to rent, they can. And this is a way where it would give them, it may give them an incentive to visit their family for six months of the year and free up a unit that we can use mm -hmm. for our purposes without having to construct more. Do, I mean, we do, do place, need more construction, but it's... Place equal weight on both those outcomes in making this decision? Is your priority to provide opportunity for seniors or is your priority to help the community satisfy its affordable housing goals? In driving, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think it helps both of it helps it helps both issues. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Secondly, what does the tenant marketplace look like? Are there is there a, a is there an inventory of willing owners asking for this opportunity? We don't, we don't know, know yet. We have no idea. We have no idea. So it wasn't market. We haven't. Market it, we have it, well, because no. like, I, like I said, we haven't really. Uh, first of all, we haven't really specifically targeted retirees on this question. Uh -huh. This is what. That's why I think Rick suggested that we do a pilot program or a, okay. for a period of two or three years. First of all, it's going to take us a year, year and a half to even get the availability of this program known in the marketplace. Okay. So right. it, it's driven by the board and. By the option board? Actually, it was a, actually no, was I think it came back session. in October. Uh, that, that and Frontiers Group. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on, also on the senior council, yeah. and I've kind of thrown it out to seniors, like at the senior center. And the one thing for some of them, they would like to maybe, you know, spend the winter with their family who lives in Texas or something like that. But in a lot of cases, you know, their unit may be paid off. They don't have the finances to be able to do that. Uh -huh. So it's one of those things where they've said, you know, they would consider it, but they didn't think of it because they never thought it was a possibility of ever doing okay, it. Okay, I so know we talked about this in, in October. I thought yes, I, I, we did. I thought it was kind of market driven. They were the owners were coming to us, but were, apparently it's no, it's not. Cindy it's did powerful. say there are no, no. some. Mm -hmm. there okay, were there were a couple of people at that meeting uh -huh. that were would like the opportunity to do this. Okay, good. Um, is your board unanimous in supporting this? Yes. 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 And have you explored what the unintended consequences, if any, they might be, beyond the beyond the um, cons listed on page four of the memo? The I, I, I tried to think through this myself, and I don't I don't have the um, enough I think detailed understanding of the implications of the of the motion. Well, all I could say, Steve, is I've been in the rental business for thirty years, 
and and I can't this I can't see any un, uh, unexpected consequences from this program. But then again, we're dealing with people, and there are a lot of programs out there. I, you know, what is it? ADU program, for one. Well, no one expected what would happen with that when it was originally proposed. Mm -hmm. That's why I, you know, I think we're suggesting we really don't know all the specifics and what these, if there could be or if there will be untold consequences. I do think one thing we will find with this is how many condo <coughs> associations actually have restrictions not allowing rentals that seniors are the unintended consequences or they're suddenly going to find out their homeowners association passed a rule that they didn't know about okay. or they never knew was there. But my final question has to do, and Rob, you may have touched on this, it has to do with, with the um, kind of the, a profit threshold. And I'm sure that if we haven't discussed it, perhaps you will. Yeah, how, how much can be made on renting these units? Will, will, will there be a. That's the $50. $50 a month. Above their expenses. Above cost. That's it. That's it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Derek? What? Do I have someone else waiting? Oh, Derek. Thank you. Um, in the memory, you got it, the draft section six, is that what's being proposed for in this language? I don't have a copy there. So, Ron, I think you said when you started that one of the things you'd have to get approval by your HOA? Uh, so HOAs yeah. would have to give approval to the rentals. Uh, no, they have to notify. Yeah, less they have to be notified that you're going to yeah. do it. The HOA, I think, it, I think generally in most of the um, uh, condominium association declarations and everything else, that uh, the the association either allows rentals, doesn't allow rentals, also conditions of approval if it's a city project, or uh, and finally deed restrictions. So there are three areas in which. Uh, rental matters can be dealt with. So the easiest way to do it is just to talk to the homeowners association and to make sure that, it's just to let them know what's going on. I mean, well, I live in Little Ajax and it's happened over there two or three times. And they, uh, one time they didn't come to the association and we were a little miffed about it, you know. Uh, had no problems, the tenants turned out to be good, but they they did notify APTU, but they didn't notify the HOA, and so there were people living in the building we didn't know about. It wasn't really something that, well, you're going to have to pay extra dues or something in order to get permission to rent. That that's not the point. The point is just keeping people informed of what's going on. So one thing I'm concerned about is we're going to in a couple of weeks have a discussion about dogs at Burling Game, which is going to be spirited. <laughs> um, can oh. HOAs change? Their Absolutely. rules? Not with regards to dogs. Yes. No, no, people, no, no. This program. So, yes. so an HOA could yeah. say, we don't want this. Yep. Cindy, you and I could get together and find one more. Program. Well, it depends on where, it where, it, where no. it's found in their documents. If it's found in their rules and regulations or it's found in their uh, bylaws, they can change it pretty easily. The board can do it. If it's in their declaration, it's not so easy to change. <laughs> The they can add it to their, <laughs> their HOA associates. They can, yes. they can, they you they can, can always change it. It, your documents. They can change their bylaws to include Absolutely. it. Yes. Right. So that's can one. everything be done by an election? What? Can it yes. all be done yeah. by an election? Yeah. Yes. It could be, uh, association. Homeowners association. I mean, it's, it's a little technical. There's some but. homeowners association that won't allow affordable housing in their complexes, too, that, you know, other oh, than a legal suit, we can't change. So yeah. That's one thing I worry about that's maybe an unintended consequence is that some HOAs would get together and not want this at a certain period of time, and but that, I mean, the, the I still HOA think it's worth the test. It's worth looking at. It's yeah. worth exploring. But the, the HOA rules were, will supersede these suggestions. That's so correct. if, if yeah. there's an HOA that doesn't want this to happen, it won't happen. They have, the, they, have the, they have the they have the okay. they have the ability to do so. <laughs> yeah, or change if, if they feel that you know loosen them up if they find it as well. I mean, who knows. Is that the HOA is their own independent nonprofit corporation? It's up to them, right? Yes. So, and then my last question is thinking about the retirement issue, but then also thinking about the kind of legacy with your kids. Can you, if you're 65, could you lease to your kids? You if take they qualify, off for six months. If they qualify, they sure. Why not? And. <clears throat> I, I, I mean, I, it's yes. not in it's not in the ordinance, but I would I would assume that it's already allowed now. Yeah, why? Why not? 
one thing is I'm trying to figure out how to have my kids start paying right now. Oh. <laughs> Ken, school. Ken help me with that. One's in middle, one's in middle school. I don't need to put them up. They can, you can set up a sublease. Oh, Derek. <laughs> a lot of medical bills. You could include the cost of the oxygen and the you know, x-ray machines that you need at your house. Yeah, it's Ken's. Adam? Um, welcome, afterward. No, I think this is a great idea to refresh everyone's memory. In October, we talked about this. Um, it, it was a, it was a suggestion that came, I think, from Frontiers before I even got involved. So it's been like four years ago, and I think it kind of came in front at the time between council and board of county commissioners, and ran into some issues at the council table and died away. And I think we all agreed, APSHA as well as Frontiers, as well as I think the joint board, when we had a meeting in October, that this would be somewhat of a test case for the process of trying to get something through at a, at a joint meeting. And then they were going to be, the APSHA board was going to be invited kind of for about a half an hour uh, of every joint meeting, because I think there was a view that from both boards that there was um, kind of a lack of understanding or appreciation or time to get some face-to-face -face time. And so that's kind of what we set it up. And as it so happens, they brought together this, this six-month extension. So I think it's a great idea. Um, I think Rob brought up some good points as well as some others, but I think one, I think most of the consequences will be good if they if they do come about. I think we we are seeing this retirement pressure long term in the for sale ownership thing, and if this relieves some of that, that could be helpful as well to to kind of clear up some of the inventory. But I think it's a great program and a great process, and thank you guys for doing a lot of good work on it. Okay, um, before we proceed, I want to say two things. I think this is important for long term, looking at the bigger picture, you know, getting away from the rents and the dogs and, the, you know, watering the plants issues. I see seasonal housing construction and creation has always been a difficult thing for <coughs> APJA for a couple of reasons. One is that you have seasons where you don't have enough and others where you don't have any, any demand. So things are full or empty. and. They go back and forth, so it fluctuates a lot. This is a, this would fill the niche, um, would help fill that niche and reduce the need for APTRA to create the most difficult kind of housing. And that housing is difficult also because neighbors generally fight harder against seasonal housing than uh, full-time housing, you know, for all the stereotypical reasons like they party too much. <coughs> They're going to be loud or they're going to do something and, you know, we don't trust them and they're foreigners and all the xenophobia that we all have and share various degrees. Second, um, all the census data that I've been bringing to you periodically shows that free market housing is going to be increasingly less available to serve the workforce. So there, is, there was a time, and I lived here during that time, some of you did, uh, when the West End was seasonal housing. And the population there was much greater than it is now. And you could rent things there. It's gone. It really is. There's not rental housing. You, you, don't, you don't get a bunch of guys together and rent a house for the season you know, on the West End uh, for a bunch of reasons. But the data also suggests, and uh, Chuck Fry has supported that, you, you don't have condominiums, <coughs> which are an important part of our base, available for rental as they become gentrified, that is, they become worth a million or two million or five thousand, five million, I'm sorry, uh, they are not rented as much. And they're not rented as much to tourists. They're not rented as much to locals. They're just, for the same reasons the West End, it's not, it's not really uh, about the character of the people renting, but it is a lot about um, the relative return on investment of having, say, Marsha paying $800 a month for a bedroom in a house that has a lot of interior makeup and value. You know, Marsha could drop a glass and that'd be 85 months rent. So, not that she ever would. So, the two reasons I think it, it's hard for us to create seasonal rental problem. And second, the rental base continues to shrink by any objective measure that I've, I've seen the rental base continues to decline. So I will support this. And I guess at this point, all we need to say is, does the BOCC and the uh, city council direct to have this amendments brought to us for uh, ratification in our individual respective meetings? Is that what we want to yeah. do? 
Yeah. Marcia? I did think of one other thing that I've had a few seniors mention. Let it go. It's another thing that spits for is like when someone has a medical issue that they need to be somewhere else, like hip replacement or something like that, which it gives them the ability to have somebody watching their place and paying for the expenses while they're having a right. hip replaced or, you know, different surgery or rehab from something. And that's another little niche it fits into. Of course, hip, hip surgery is like day surgery now. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <coughs> okay. So I think we, I've, unless I hear an objection, that will come to the respective boards for consideration. And if there's a, you know, Amendments by either board. I guess we'll have like the equivalent of a conference committee, except it won't be partisan. So we'll try to resolve that. Tom, Mick, could I ask the boards if they have any particular concerns to forward them to staff so that we can try to incorporate them into yeah. the document to bring to the board? Yeah. If, right. If somebody thinks of something that we've <coughs> overlooked today, we can bring that to you before that gets submitted. Also, but I know there was concerns about the app actual process once uh, an owner and a potential tenant has been uh, identified. But I, I, I think that that's outside the scope of what we want to do here. I think it's important that we get it done right. Well, I, I, I presume that but it's HO, not, HOAs will not be voting on the appropriateness of an individual to no. live in their complex. So. No. No. So I think you can work that it's out. Just a, okay. Basically, it's just a communication to the, all if right. they have a restriction on rentals, then they all tell us. But other than that, uh, all right. it'll also provide our database with some additional information. Do we have other housing guide re guideline revisions before us? I think so. You're free to go. We are. Oh, let, me, let me just comment on that real quick, because I, I, oh. I do think it's APSHA's responsibility when one of these contracts gets signed mm -hmm. and qualified to have the information to protect both the renter yes. and the rentee. Well, we'll have a copy of the, the information is, you know, like this saying, so you need to make filters. sure that this is okay with your HOA. Yeah. You right. need to make sure that you have a legal Pay contract in place. You need to make sure that we will not allow any other financial arrangements other than the financial Just arrangements right. regarding right. this. So I do think it's APSHA's responsibility to go beyond this change and have the information to protect both the renter and the rentee. I think and, and that uh, language should, because we require copies of the leases where we're yeah. going to see yeah. them. So we we'll, require yeah. the HOA to approve the leave of absence first as well, so that they're aware, and they need to have an emergency contact person as well. Rachel? Uh, thanks, and I don't want to belabor this any longer <clears throat> than necessary because I think it's a good program but it did raise a, a final question for me and it may or may not be answered now but does app just see itself as advertising these so when someone comes in and says I, I'm willing to make it available for six months if I go away they have to find the tenant they have to do the advertising they have to bring it in and then you guys will be part of the leasing process obviously with the application for qualifications but you're making no guarantees as to the condition of the unit. So uh, if someone think, comes back in and says, oh my gosh, it's got silverfish all over the place, I didn't realize this, it, it, it's strictly between the tenant and the owner. I think our responsibility is to create awareness of the program, mm -hmm. and then it's up to the uh, person who owns the property to, to take, take that program following the, the, the <laughs> specifications, so, guidelines, everything, through the process. Okay, and complete it. Thank you. Uh, Cindy, you raised your hand. Were there other revisions in the guidelines that we were here to consider? Well, let me come up here quick. Do you have some revisions? Well, so we just going to talk to talk you. Well, this is some of the this is this is just some of the issues that we're going to be bringing forward to the board, and we want to make sure that there isn't any. If, if, if we're hoping that everybody will agree that these are items that we need to bring forward to you. Um, one of them has to do with some more information with regards to retirement. This just has to do with owners and the ability to rent six months. Okay. What we want to bring forward to you is, is should somebody who just comes here, say they're 60 years old, is it right for them to just work four years and then retire in the house? That this condition? Or should that be longer? We don't know if you would support something like that. Maybe somebody before they retire has to work here 10 years. Or maybe there's something in between four and ten. Right now, it's four years. 
Well, I yeah. think you can make a recommendation to us and we can take it up at that time. Right. Rather than have us try to do it for you here. My board has not discussed this right. at all. Right, right. So, okay, so. It has not been brought to us. So have the discussion and bring us the results. And one of the, one of the uh, other items that, in the, and I believe it was part of the discussion at the um, work session, has to do with some type of uh, HOA help desk type thing. And we want, we want to come back with ideas for that as well. Okay. For all of you. I don't uh, hear any objection to that either. Right. And right now, and the board just has started re reviewing the guidelines. What we did is we had a, a consultant redo the guidelines to and modify the guidelines to make them more user friendly. And she didn't do any policy changes in them, but we're bringing them back piecemeal by each section we're bringing them back. And then if we have a specific policy, policy change, we take that forward to the board, and then we would like to bring those to you as well, if well, that's okay. Th that's always the process anyway. Great, right. because right. we're, we're going to try to get done through the whole guidelines this year. That'd be cool. Then we can start doing them in, with the AACP next <laughs> year. <laughs> and that was it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, APCHA, for Thanks. your work. Tom, hope you're well soon. Thank you, guys. I hope you feel better than I sound. We're doing too good. Um, Health and Human Services update. Who's leading that? John Peacock? Sorry, you caught me uh, emailing there, Mick. Oh, no. So this is just a uh, brief update um, for the council and, and the board. Um, we have put together a subcommittee um, to look at the uh, funding options and issues um, for uh, nonprofits, specifically health and human service oriented nonprofits. Um, we have met twice. First, let me just say the uh, participants on that committee, um, of, of course, from the city of Aspen, we have Adam Frisch and uh, Steve Skadron, and from the staff, uh, Steve Barwick and uh, Barry Crook have been participating uh, from the county. We have Rachel Richards and George Newman um, and Nan Sundin and myself. And then we do have three representatives from the nonprofit uh, sector, uh, Liz Stark, Marky Butler, and uh, Liz Lindsay from uh, uh, the Buddy Program. In essence, what we've we've met twice and uh, we're, we're following a, a process that really focuses first on making sure everyone's defining the problem the same way, so identifying what the different uh, interests and issues are before we even start talking about what potential solutions that would be beneficial to, to everyone might look like. Um, and, and we've taken up some, some time really exploring that problem definition phase together. Um, we're getting ready to, to move in to starting to generate some solutions based on what we understand, um, each other's <coughs> interests, each other's uh, different issues that need to be addressed on. We're, we're not to that phase yet. Um, and so we don't have a lot of outcome at this point to report, but just wanted to update everyone that we're, we're in a process, we're in discussions. Um, I think they've been productive, um, even though we, we don't have any uh, potential solutions to report out to you at this point. All right. Do any of the representatives, Adam, Rachel, nope, I'm George, good. Tori, Skadron, have anything else to say on this? No, nope, thanks, John, for the summary. Okay. Thank you. But we're making progress. <laughs> making progress. Talks were productive. We're at least meeting. <laughs> The warring factions are meeting. But I could say the Middle Eastern sense or. <laughs> okay. I'll we'll accept too. All right. Um, that should bring us to the Pro Cycle Challenge planning process. We're, we're, yes? We're, we're zooming right along, aren't we? We are zooming all along, right along. This one is probably going to take more than 10 minutes, so that's good. You think? All right. What is the process here? Well, the uh, and you know, I'll, I'll invite uh, commissioners to to jump in. But really, this was an agenda item that was requested um, by the board, just as an opportunity 
uh, to discuss uh, the the process as it's moving forward. I see Nancy uh, coming up, so she may want to put some some more context uh, around it. Um, but it's really just to make sure we're on the same page about, I think, how um, we're moving forward with uh, consideration of the um, permitting process as well as um, you know, to have an opportunity to address, I think, some of the concerns that the um, board members had expressed, just so the council's aware, um, and we're not doing it through the newspapers uh, necessarily. Um, so, just briefly, and, and Nancy, I'll ask you to jump in and, and or kick me under the table if I go down the, the wrong path from your perspective, but um, really, you know, the, the, the county at this point is, uh, has to go through its special events <laughs> permitting process, which does include, it outlines a public process, which includes outreach to the neighborhoods, outreach to the uh, caucuses, we uh, outreach to our, our public safety and other service providers um, in, in considering a special event permit. And so at, um, we, we do not have a permit that's been submitted yet. Um, in working with staff, what we've asked is that some initial outreach take place uh, with the concerned parties, particularly caucus. Uh, we, we've identified a whole host of stakeholders at this point that uh, could provide input into what would be the, the challenges and potential <coughs> solutions with various route options. From there, it is our hope that um, we'll be able to consider route alternatives um, and, and take that input um, from, from the public as well as um, from other concerned officials to finalize a, a route to bring through our permitting process uh, formally. And so that was really the discussion, I think, that happened uh, mm -hmm. last time Nancy was in front of us. I think the board maybe wanted an opportunity to you know, express some of the concerns that they feel are going to need to be worked through uh, throughout the permit process. So. Uh, Nancy, I don't know if you want to add anything to what I said. Um, just that we are moving forward in what the board requested. We're working with the county staff. Um, we've reached out to all the caucuses in one way or another. We do have some meetings set. Others were just waiting to hear back. And so we are um, making progress. We're having meetings actually starting this week with homeowners associations and caucuses to get feedback. And so then I'd, I'd <coughs> make, turn it back to you guys. To, um, well, commissioners want to say something to us or hear something from us. Start with Rob Itner. I'll start. Um, I think it's really exciting, first of all, that we've got this um, overall start and, and start finish and then start the next day. So I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of pluses to the whole thing. I think some of the things that were, were brought up in our, our BOCC work session with Nancy and, and uh, the medalist sports people, I believe, were there too, were just really having an understanding um, with this circuit of uh, traffic plan and access to places like the airport for people, our, our, one of our major hubs in and out of the community. Um, it's the day after the music festival ends, so there'll be probably a pretty heavy traffic in and out of the airport. Um, my guess is, by the look of the, the proposed routes, and I know they're still getting worked out, that it's going to be a uh, breakaway Peloton type of race. It's not a huge mountain type race where, where it gets divided up tremendously. So to keep 82 open, you know, having a traffic study done, those, that was one of the major concerns that, that we addressed, I think, and, and how it's going to interrupt flow. And are we going to be able to have traffic movement on this course when the race is not nearby? Because Independence Pass, as we all know, was closed down from, I don't know, 11 in the morning till 5 at night or something. In reality, it really only took, what, two hours to get over Independence Pass. So 
is what sort of closures are we looking at? What sort of closures are we looking at in 82? What sort of access to the airport? What sort of access to the hospital? What sort of access to the senior center? Um, all of these uh, various routes, um, it, it's really going to take some major coordination to figure out the exact time that that race is going to be working around in different places and when traffic can be allowed through on the rest of that course without having the course blocked off. Good, good point. Um, Steve. Well, I see the title of this as Pro Cycle Challenge, and we might call it the Elected Officials Challenge to help make this thing work. You're going to be riding in it too? <laughs> Um, we do have we do have concerns definitely on portions of the the route that they'll be draw you know that's proposed for the bicyclists to be riding around. It's going to impact dozens and dozens of driveways and access points. And I know that there's a way we could make this proposed route work, but it's going to take some ingenuity and creative. Thinking, um, and that's our challenge. I think to to try to make it work. Uh, I don't want to see Owl Creek and Brush Creek and McLean Flats roads all shut down for a five-hour period or something. That would not work for the residents. But having some kind of <coughs> you know rolling closures as the Bicyclists go by an area, then the road opens up for another 15 or 20 minutes or however long until the, the racers come back by. And I know we can make it work. Other comments? George Newman. I don't think any of those proposed routes do work. Um, and, and on top of just the concerns from public safety, access to the airport, uh, to the hospital. Um, you're talking about a work day in the summertime uh, where the whole workforce and the service deliveries and the contractors um, will be severely uh, impacted. And we're just starting to see our economy bounce back. We're just starting to see our building trades bounce back. And, and this, this will be a tremendous impact, not just uh, for the Aspen area, but for the entire uh, valley. And to, to think that a rolling, uh, a way to sort of have a rolling stock work uh, along Highway 82, just I don't think is practical. Because uh, if you stop traffic for 15, 20 minutes, that backs up and continues to back up. Um, and, and you might as well just close the highway completely. So I had suggested some different routes. I think there are ways to, to pull off a, a successful race, uh, to mitigate, minimize the impacts to our entire community, as well as our guests. Uh, this is still summertime. There's, there's actually, it's hard to believe, but there's guests that come here uh, that will be uh, perhaps uh, put off by all, all of these impacts when they just wanted to come up to Aspen for an Aspen Snowmass for a great uh, family vacation. And all of a sudden they're in the midst of a huge bike race and, and roads are closed off and they can't get anywhere. So I have serious reservations on the proposed routes. I think, uh, I think the community will have an opportunity to provide that input. Uh, and I think we should be looking at seriously some, some alternate <coughs> routes. Um, that will not impact Highway 82, not impact the roundabout, uh, but still provide a great experience for the, uh, the bike racers as well as a great um, experience for the visitors and all of us who want to view the events. Other comments? Michael? Well, just to reiterate, I mean, th there were just serious concerns about the race in this route. And, and I think what was asked of, of, uh, of your staff was that it wasn't just a question of presenting those alternatives. It was a question of proving that any one of those alternatives would work in a way that would satisfy the people impacted by it, whether it's neighborhoods or whether it's people on 82. And so 
that's the task that we left the, your staff, and and that's the task they have going out to individuals and homeowners groups and caucuses to actually make a case that they can do it in a way that's safe and and allows community activities to continue while the church is going on. So that's the challenge for your staff. Rachel. Yeah. I'm glad we're able to have this discussion, and uh, I think there's a, a couple of things kind of playing at once. One, we're talking about process, and we all know the timelines that um, uh, Leslie was under and others to put the application in, to be a competitive application, and uh, you know there was some early dialogue and, and concerns were expressed from our board, but. We don't want to be put in the position of being a, the spoilers if, if a lot of work and time gets invested in just one route and then it gets to the special event permit final hearing and it could be declined. You know, it, it's not a, not a given. I mean, there's no given on this. And the concerns that the board members have expressed about inconvenience to people's lives and the larger disruption of the coming into Aspen is just an entirely different thing than coming into Aspen through Independence Pass. You know, we don't have very much commuting workforce coming in from Independence Pass, very little delivery trucks, very little activity. And so this, this is just an entirely different set of, of impacts that cannot be measured on the same scale as the Independence Pass impacts. I mean, there's a lot of the same work in terms of telling people they can't use the road for the next four hours, but it involves vastly more neighborhoods, vastly more commuting population. And um, so again, we don't want to be in the position of being a spoiler, but we also do have to represent <coughs> our constituency very much. And um, you know, I, I, I tend to agree with the comment that uh, others have made about whether a rolling closure would be able to work or not because rolling closures are generally in one direction. They're closing the road as the drivers are going through. They don't do rolling closures so much uh, on a lap route. And if um, one rider is doing exceptionally well, has passed his drug test and everything, but starts lapping all the other riders, what are they going to do? They're, you know, what, what if he gets that far ahead of the rolling closure? So I have concerns of whether that could really work. And you know, George was the one who <clears throat> had first suggested it. And I think it's great the way that this is a collaborative effort to bring into Snowmass into this a little more directly, to assist Snowmass lodging numbers and, and their community as a whole is happy to participate. But is there a way to fashion a route that is more of the criteria between Aspen and Snowmass and, and some, some loops through there and through Snowmass and through the town without having to go down 82 and up McLean Flats and back around? And I think that that is the extra loop that really starts to, um, you know, create uh, a lot more challenges. And I, I know I'm kind of mixing different routes in my mind, but at least for one of them, it was like, okay, this is on 82 and this is on McLean Flats. It's like there's no safety valve at all. You know, traditionally when there's car accidents or ice or problems on 82, everyone takes McLean Flats, so at least there's the safety valve. But if we were incorporating that into the race, there's no safety valve at all and we're just, you know, fairly locked. And so. Um, you know, as someone who once had to drive my son with two broken wrists to the hospital <laughs> during rush hour traffic, you know what it's like to just be locked. You know, there's, there's no way to go. There's nowhere to go. And how, how do you do that and then have it be safe for the riders? Because occasionally, and uh, I remember I think uh, one time J.E. DeVilbus had told the uh, Fourth of July, police. Damn it! I, there's no parade yet. I'm going down Main Street and just took off. You know, and and how well did that work out? It wasn't a problem, but you know, there's going to be a, a, a people get a certain frustration level and then just say, to heck with it. I'm going to get a ticket. You know, ticket me. I got to be somewhere." Was so, he a, was he an elected official at that time? He was. I think uh, maybe it was right before. I can't remember. Nice. <laughs> So anyhow, th th those are our concerns. They're real. You know, we're hearing from our citizens about it, and and um, I, I, the sooner we're able to go through all this process to work those things out, and it, it comes to more of a head, I think the better for all of us. Okay. Anyone else? Rob again. Here. I took different topics, so I was just hitting the first one. Now I've got another one too. Um, 
it's another concern that I brought up in, in the BOCC meeting that's more from, from the business community side of things, which is because it hasn't really been developed or put out there yet, although we did get some information from Nancy in the, in the work session that we had, which is really understanding what the um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday pre-race is going to be, what's going to be happening in town. Um, the last time the bike race was here, there was a tremendous amount of street closures um, overnight for buses to be parking. My understanding is that most of that's going to be taking place in Snowmass, which I think is wonderful. And, and, and I'll reiterate, I think this is a fabulous <coughs> opportunity. It's just a concern. Um, but it is a busy weekend. The last weekend of the music festival is a busy weekend. I can tell you from my restaurant experience that it's a good numbers weekend. Um, so just, I, I know it's going to bring a lot of extra business into Snowmass where there probably is a lot of vacancies and that sort of stuff, less so in Aspen restaurants and that sort of stuff. So getting that plan out to the business community, the ACRA community, um, the Snowmass community, and, and exactly what's going to be going on in terms of events. We know that auxiliary events pop up for these things all the time. Well, we're going to do this you know, mountain bike race series on Tuesday, and that's going to affect this. And we're going to do, you know, a woman's race. I don't know if that's, I, I don't think that's in the works for this, this go around. Um, but the more information that we can get out to the business community so that they can plan to take advantage as opposed to be victim to <coughs> closures, that sort of thing, um, is, is important. <coughs> All right. Derek, um, I, I think I hope these things can be worked out. I mean, year one of this race, we I think got a little ahead of ourselves and we effectively shut down the town. Um, and, and then the second year, we loosened that up and allowed people to mm -hmm. know that they could drive. I remember, mm -hmm. remember driving down 82, weaving back and forth, <laughs> plenty of room at 9 a.m. Um, so I think we, with enough time, we can figure this out. Other communities have figured this out, not only with this race, but I think I'm the biggest bike advocate and rider in this group, certainly. Um, Your biggest, period. <laughs> um, the Tour de France, I understand, is a I fairly <laughs> marginal bike race compared to this one. And yeah. they figure it out year after year. Um, so so I, I, I think this, this can be worked out and these issues can be addressed. I think for this community, this thing, and now we're adding snow mass, this is a good thing for this time of year. And I think um, we need to be, personally, I think we need to be a little more supportive and, and positive about trying to find these alternatives and address these issues and, and, and get to it. So I hope we can, we can do that and work <coughs> together and Nancy taking the lead on that to, to get this done and, and inform our, our community as to what the options are, the alternatives are, and, and hold another world-class event. Well, Rachel? Let, let me ask, I don't know if this is for Nancy or, or Jeff or any of your <coughs> other uh, very talented staff, but have you looked at now an alternative C or D route that is um, more contained between Aspen and Snowmass and still would uh, fulfill the requirements of a, a good criterion? We have um, several route options. We actually got the video of the meeting and kind of took George's and yours and you know, um, created some routes, and we have sent them to Medalist in the Pro Challenge. And so, you know, that's kind of where our initial feedback needs to start from. Because if it doesn't fall within UCI rules and things like that, then there's no sense pursuing it. So um, we have sent forward about four more routes to them and um, are just kind of awaiting their responses. Mm -hmm. yes. Anyone else? I was just going to ask, yes, Adam. any other comments that you want to make to any of us or TV land? Um, sure. That we, you know, we did, um, I hope, I didn't hear anything new tonight because I hope we took really good notes. And again, we went back through the video and we are trying to do our absolute very best to due diligence to um, take every one of your concerns and really mitigate them and, you know, help us all work through them. We, we want to make a successful event, and it has to be successful for all of us. And so we understand that working with you and working with our entire community is how we get there. So we are um, really, you know, working with 
the Picking County Sheriff's Office, the airport, the hospital, you know, we're really, we're having those meetings, we're trying to work through all this, um, talking with medalists, talking to the Pro Challenge, you know, we're not, we don't think we're leaving anything kind of off the table. Everything's kind of back on there and we're really trying to look very carefully at each component and just making sure, like Derek said, that we have a day that really, you know, works well for all of us and just brings another fun world class event. But um, we are, you know, we are working through kind of everything that you did bring up. And one of the reasons we are, you know, um, working through it so fast is, you know, A, because we do need to know, you know, what the route looks like so we can plan everything else and push that information out. So not only to the citizens, but to the businesses. And hopefully everybody will get creative and really, um, you know, be proactive and, and embrace it. And that is definitely our goal. What's our timeline, and do you have a timeline for yourself from, from Medalist? Um, we are coming back to the BOCC on March 12th um, with the results from all of our kind of routes and our caucus meetings and HOA meetings. So really the end of this month, four weeks. Okay. So I mean, I, I, I feel for the county's position, I hope, and I know they don't want to be the Drugs. bad group, whatever. But I hope we can try to figure out something that that works for everything, and and hopefully we can look at it in the big picture. I'm not sure how much other activity or events come close to shutting anything down or put severe pinch points on places besides this one in, the, in an entire year. Uh, but hopefully we can work something out. And I appreciate the county for trying to come up with something that uh, that will work. So I'll keep up the good work, Nancy. Um, anyone else? Okay, I have a few comments. Yes, John P. May, I, I was just going to close out, but I'm going to let you close out if you'll let me go first. No, you um, can go. <laughs> but uh, you just, you know, I, I, I think really, you know, the, the concerns have been summed up well, and it was just ensuring from the county's perspective that we didn't have a solution that got ahead of us you know, or a solution or a route that got ahead of us identifying the types of issues that we needed to address versus having some flexibility and, and route design. And I appreciate uh, very much, Nancy, you and, and the city staff has been identifying uh, alternative routes out after that discussion. And so um, this is probably right where we should be um, at this point in, in these discussions. And, you know, I don't think, you know, it's not the board's position that um, to take a negative position on the bike race so much as to do the best job we can to address the various community concerns and public safety concerns. And for that, we got to work together and, and we've got to have some flexibility on how we implement this thing. So I just wanted to close out that way. Thanks, Mick, for indulging okay. me. Um, I have a few comments. Uh, we need to develop, I, I think a little more information could be developed around the airport traffic on that day. Those numbers are available. Mm -hmm. um, people tend to leave the music festival early in the day. The, um, but we could check. We could find out what that, what that's like. Uh, we have a lot of experience with regulating the hours and operation of the building trades. And the experience we have over the last six years is that almost universally, what we hear from them is they want to be in here early in the day. Now, they, for various reasons, they don't start these things early in the day because of television. So. The conflict there is going to, I think, and we can check, is going to be pretty minimal. You don't have a 7 a.m. race start. Nobody's watching at that time of day here or in Europe. Um, the one variable that we do control is the time of day. So we can work on that so that it doesn't interfere with the commute to the extent that we have commute. Again, we have traffic numbers on the commute for the comparable days over the years, and we can see when that peaks and so on. So I think we should look at that. Um, you know, Jerry Brown used to go around saying that uh, the Chinese character for crisis was a combination of danger and opportunity, and then a bunch of scholars proved him wrong, and there's an ongoing dispute about that, but he still used it to great effect, and I think there is both danger and opportunity here. Uh, dangers which you've outlined, uh, and danger that we, that we go too far in our restrictions and don't serve the community, but dangers that we also, that we jeopardize the community. I don't think there's any desire on the part of the city of Aspen to impose a limitation on people's need for emergency access, and I don't think that will happen. But uh, 
there is that, but the, I want to look at the opportunity side here for a second. Over the last six years, we've worked really hard as a, as, as a council to reorient the community to uh, events and, and tourism that is sustainable and that will keep our economy going and will not be subject to the ups and downs of the speculative real estate market. And to some extent, I think we've succeeded in that. A sales tax is up, of course you share in that. Um, tourism is up, people are giving us high marks for our welcomeness. But we're all always, always needing to be on the edge, the, the leader in some of these, uh, in some aspects, so that we can retain our vitality. We've decided that we're not going to try to do as they do in Lion's Head, have 70-foot building heights or 81-foot maximums, but rather that we're going to emphasize people coming to town, sharing this beauty, and, and, and paying for it. And they have and they do. Um, but we also were threatened with the probable or quite possible loss of the X Games. X Games are a major thing here. And when I was a commissioner back in the day, X Games is a county event, and it came to the county, and there were a lot of uncertainty about it. In fact, the first year that we did it, it was a mess. It really was an inconvenience for the public. It, you know, we worked, we worked through that, and we learned from it. But it, it didn't start out smoothly and everything working. And there were people who objected. But we at the city, we've tried to measure business support for this event, and we've asked people, do you support this event? And does it affect your business? And even the people who say that it negatively affects their business for a day were unanimous or near unanimous. I think there's one exception, my neighbor, in saying they want this event to come back. Because there's something special and magical about having an event that really does have broad support for the, by the community and for which people are willing to make sacrifices in their daily routines in order to host it. And that's really what we're about, in the, at least in the city, to some extent in the county, is being a, is being a host, a, a sharing what we have. Um, and as you probably noticed in today's weather, you know, the, the prospects for guaranteed winter snow season bonanza are not the best. And we have to think about how we continue to sustain this place that we all love with uh, other events and activities. It's not that the bicycle thing is going to provide a you know, cash bonanza, but it does so much, I think, to shape how people view us. And, and not everybody views us positively. Some people view us as uh, you know, all the stereotypes about the rich and famous and the snobs and the stuff inaccessible. And the bicycle thing, being a bicycle community, and there are other steps we hope to take, and some that you've already taken, like surfacing Castle Creek Road, has the potential to allow us a, uh, a good reach into that market of people who ride bicycles and enjoy them. Uh, true, it, it, you know, there, with every event we do, whether it's Fourth of July or uh, X Games or Winter National, that, there is some public inconvenience. And that has to be weighed against, the, you know, the, just the joy that people find in this event. I, the, the thing that I will remember most, not being mayor anymore in whatever months and days it is, some of your, some of your counting the hours back there, but it's the feeling on the streets during those events. The, the way that people came up to you and just said to me and to others how happy they were to be a part of this. That is just irreplaceable. It does come at some cost. And, and, and to me, is, uh, it shouldn't come at a public safety cost. But it, if, if there is some inconvenience, yes, somebody can't get to your store exactly when they want to. They can't drive exactly when they want to. But the joy of that, those days and that week is something I will never forget. And, and, and it's, just un, it's just irreplaceable. That sense in the community, and it's 
you know, you, you so seldom find in a town. And I'm not just talking about city residents, I'm talking about everybody who was there. And that happiness that they still, a lot of people still feel about that event. And my time's up, so thank you. And please, please take that into account and balance that against, yeah, there may be some inconvenience and there may be uh, some extra work. <clears throat> so I'm sure the price process will go forward and I hope it comes to a conclusion we can all agree on. Thanks. And that brings me to an unanswered phone call and <clears throat> incident command training announcement. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you, Thank you Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, John Peacock. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm the next one, too. So, no, I'm incident command. You want command. the last word and the first word? Okay. I, I, I take what I can get, Mick. <laughs> so, um, just real briefly, the, um, we, the Picking County Emerg Emergency Management Office has arranged a uh, training uh, with Chuck Vale from the Colorado Department of Public Safety and Division of Homeland Security. And what it is, is it's an elected official um, training on incident command protocols. We thought this was a good opportunity. We originally were setting it up uh, for the board. And as we talked about um, what this would really look like if we had a major event, we're going to have the city of Aspen, probably town of Snowmass, uh, Basalt. And so we uh, wanted to open up that training and make it available um, for all elected officials and managers. I, um, Steve, hopefully you've received an invitation. You may not have had a chance to, to share that yet. But just to uh, put it on your radar screen, um, the class will be on April 3rd. Uh, it's scheduled from 12.30 to 4.30, and it's scheduled to be at the El Jebel Fire Station. Uh, I do know um, we'll have commissioners there. We'll also have commissioners, at least two commissioners from Eagle County, as well as Basalt. We haven't uh, heard back from Snowmass or Aspen yet, but you have plenty of time to let us know. I um, plan to be there. I was... Uh volunteer in an incident one time and it almost got me killed. So I tend to do better with my next incident if I'm still mayor at that time. The um, county, you and your predecessors are to be commended in being proactive on incident commands because in the incident I'm referring to, the county's reaction was primarily county and the city's reaction was very commendable in the way we closed streets off and kept people safe and nobody was harmed and uh, we had and, and, and some of you know this better than others and Steve you're new to it but we have the county has tremendous respect in interagency respect in the valley and beyond that enabled the county at that point to mobilize a lot of people from outside here who mm -hmm. knew us and were willing and able to come in and make that incident manageable on that, that New Year's Eve incident. So that's a, that's a commendable thing, and I think you have to keep pushing forward on that. So I plan to be there, although, like I say, only a couple more months in office. Hopefully no incidents. And thank you for doing that. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Rachel Richards. You know, I'd, I'd just like to add on on that. I don't know which of your staff you're planning on attending, but. Uh, I attended uh, a, a pretty detailed session in December about communities along the Front Range and how they responded to the wildfire emergencies. So it was um, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, and then also some communities that were more flat grassland fires. And uh, you know the experience of others is invaluable, but it was all sorts of things that they hadn't thought of, of needing, that they needed, you know, and, and so it's an original response, but then it's the recovery afterwards and normalization of your community. So they were doing things like uh, having a pop-up childcare center so people could leave their kids while they were dealing with insurance uh, activities and claims, and that they were bringing their assessor's office in so people could get accurate claims, and it's just, 
food bank delivery for people and how do you mobilize phone uh, clothes when people have lost all those things and communication. So um, it, it, it was a much bigger experience than I had ever really anticipated. Also hearing from them often it was about how and when they filed as to whether they got decent reimbursements or not or who they got reimbursements from. So there was a big financial note that hit the communities as well. And so, um, you know, given the, the current drought, uh, you know, I was just talking to John earlier about, you know, counties don't really have the same sort of drought management plans because we're not a water provider. But to think about what we can do is in, in a drought management plan, and uh, certainly that's something that yeah, I'm sure you guys are looking at. Um, I was just at Water Congress last week, and the long range forecasts are not good. They're particularly bad for the Front Range and the Eastern Plains and things like that. There's hope that we will uh, have less severe drought in our areas and get the monsoon type of rains in July and August. But uh, it, the patterns are really not looking good on a long-term basis. And so I just would encourage everyone to, you know, find the appropriate staff members because you, you just don't think how many branches of your government it's going to go out and into that you're going to be assisting people with. Thanks. Okay. Unless there's any other item council or commissioners want to bring before this group, when do we meet again? Another April quarter. 2nd. <clears throat> April something? Yep. I, I do need to apologize to the council for meeting a miss, missing a meeting again. That's two already. I'm not even done with this term of office. So, thank you all. Thanks for coming, and we'll meet again in April. Thanks. That was quick. One work session, one record. I like that. One regular meeting. Both illness related. What a coincidence.